Show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see it. Open up the floodgates, the mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our brain. Open up the heavens, we want to see it. Open up the floodgates, the mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our brain. A mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our brain. A mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our brain. Amen. He deserves all our praise and all the glory. He is our reason to even be in this place this morning. Amen. We have everlasting life is because of who he is and what he's done. We have a reason to sing, a reason to praise, a reason to shout, a reason to clap our hands. We praise you, Lord. There's a reason I can sing. There's a reason for this life inside me. One name above all names, Jesus, yes, it's Jesus. There's a reason for this hope, there's a reason for this peace that I know, one worthy of all praise, it's Jesus.
reason. Amen. Turn and find two or three people right now and tell them he's the reason I'm singing this morning. Amen. As we continue to worship, we worship him by singing about the cross and all he's done for us through the cross, through his son Jesus. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated, but hallelujah for the cross, the victory. And this is what God's word had to say about that. Paul teaching and, and writing regarding that, he said, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the victory that we have because of the power of the cross, for what you did on the cross, for the forgiveness of our sins, for securing our eternity, and for giving us victory. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we live in that today. We live in that truth of that victory we have in you today. We worship in that victory today. And Father, I pray we will obey you and serve you and follow you in that victory that we have in you. Lord, I pray you be with us as we continue to worship. Through this time of giving and offering, may we be faithful to you. May we start this year faithful and strong as we gather together, as we grow in our faith, and as we go and are sent to share the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray you be with our pastor as he comes in just a few moments. Lord, you'd speak through him to us as your spirit uses your word to teach us your truth. May it penetrate into our hearts and minds and make us be transformed by your word. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. We continue to worship through our giving, our tithes, and our offerings. We continue to worship Him through singing His gospel, His story, and His praises. So after the offering plate goes by, join with us. As we continue to worship, stand with us and just worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who sits on His throne this morning. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance seen by heavy stone messiah still and all
Happy New Year. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter. We come back to 2 Peter after our Christmas hiatus for some uh, Christmas messages. 2 Peter chapter 1. It's just good to be here today, isn't it? Happy New Year. Good to be with God's people gathered in God's house. Amen? Worshiping Him. As you're turning there, let me update you on a couple of items Our Lottie Moon International Mission Offering, again, this is an offering where 100% of the monies received goes directly to Southern Baptist missionaries on the field. We set a goal of $82,000, and we're close. We're almost at $72,000, and we'll have that offering open for one more week. If you haven't given and want to help us get closer to our goal, I encourage you to do that. Number two, we begin Wednesday night activities again this Wednesday. And what a great way to start 2020 by, by coming uh, to church on Wednesday night. We'll have dinner at five, lots of activities. And during the month of January, we we're having our midweek worship service, Oasis. And I'm going to do something I've never done before, and that is I'm going to teach on church history. We'll do this in the month of January. Then when we begin February, we'll go back to our Bible studies. Uh, So I encourage you to be involved in church on Wednesday night. Let's look at our passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'll begin reading in verse 16. This is a great section of Scripture. Verse 16, 2 Peter chapter 1, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp Shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, 
that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your sure and certain word. It is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, as piercing as far of the division as soul and spirit and bone and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Take your word and show us Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Well, this message really is a perfect message for the first Sunday in January. It's a new year with new hopes, new dreams, and new goals. And let me remind you, as God's people, we are a hopeful, optimistic people because we know that whatever this new year brings our way, God will be faithful. Amen? So we are a hope-filled people. As we begin this year, I want to lay before all of us a New Year's goal. A New Year's goal. Here's the goal. To dig deeper into the Word of God in 2020. In this new year, to dig deeper into the Word of God. Now, we've done a couple things to help you. Number one, we have on the website, uh, if you go to the website and scroll down to the bottom, we have two Bible reading plans on there for you. The first is a D group, discipleship group, Bible reading plan. And that's if you're in discipleship groups. We started those. About 15 months ago, we've gone from zero, and we now have about 160 people involved in these small groups of three to five people, gender-specific. They meet weekly to pray, read the Bible, and just experience biblical community together. That's for the D groups. If you aren't in a D group, and we will have enlistment again this year, if you want to be in one, but if you're not in a D group, we have a chronological Bible reading plan. Now, both these plans are only five days a week, so it gives you a little leeway if you have a stressful, hectic day and you don't get to your Bible reading. So you've got seven days to, to read five days worth of Bible reading. I encourage you this year to dig deeper into the Word of God. Now, the words of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21 that I just read are ancient words from Peter to first century Christians, and yet because the Bible is inspired by God, these words are very relevant and very modern. See, this passage addresses authority, credibility, and trust. Now, the central theme of these six verses is this. The Bible can be trusted as God's word. This morning then, I want to just look at this passage and give you three reasons why you can trust the Bible as God's word. We're going to look at the text a little differently. We're going to look at verse 16. That'll be point one. Then we're going to skip down to verses 20 and 21. That'll be a point two. And then we're going to come back for point three to the middle section, which is really kind of the heart of this passage. Let's look at point one. Scripture can be trusted because it is confirmed by historical testimony. Let's go back and look at verse 16. Verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In the context, Peter was absolutely convinced of the truths he taught because he had personally experienced them. Now, I want you to Keep that thought. Let's just set it over here. 
Okay? Peter was absolutely convinced of the truths he was teaching because he had experienced them. Set that over here. We'll come back to that. In the context, Peter's opening assertion in verse 16 is a response to his critics' accusation that he taught carefully crafted lies to attract followers and to make money off of them. We'll talk about false teachers in chapter 2, so next week. But make no mistake about it. False teachers in the first century and false teachers in the 21st century try and use Christianity for personal gain. Peter, though, in verse 16, is responding to those who were claiming he was a false teacher. Now look at the word myth in verse 16, myths. The NIV, I think, says invented stories. That word used in the New Testament always, 100% of the time, has a negative connotation. Peter then strongly says, what we have made known to you, look in verse 16, what we have made known to you was not something we made up, he says. We are not lying. Now look back in verse 16. He then says, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The phrase there, those two words together, isn't referencing the first coming, but the second coming of Jesus. The false teachers then that were accusing Peter were not only undermining his teaching in general, They were undermining what Peter was saying about the second coming of Jesus. And they were denying the second coming, these false teachers. Look at the last phrase now in verse 1. But, Peter says, we were eyewitnesses. Look at this phrase about Jesus, of his majesty. Do you see it? Verse 16, Peter calls Jesus, if you will, your majesty. I think that's such a beautiful, another picture of Jesus. Your majesty. Peter says, listen, we were eyewitnesses. We saw Jesus. Beginning in verse 17, what Peter does is he talks about an event called the transfiguration of Jesus. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Right now, my point, though, is Jesus refer, Peter refers to the transfiguration as a historical event. So let's just stop for a moment and talk about the historical aspect of what Peter's saying. Historical facts matter, my friends. Peter is saying this is not just a good book filled with myths and fables to make you feel better about yourself. This is the Word of God. It's historical. It's true. Do people today believe the Bible? Lifeway did a study and a survey, and in the survey, 44% of the people now, 44% of the people, so only 6% less than half of the people said this about the Bible. They believe the Bible contains helpful myths, whatever a helpful myth is, and the Bible is not completely true. Peter, though, says here, we were eyewitnesses. It's historical. He speaks of the historical truth of what he saw, and we'll see in verses 20 and 21, of the prophetic writings known as Scripture. The Bible Bible speaks historically, church. This, This is why it's so important. God really created the heavens and the earth. God really created a real man named Adam and a real woman named Eve, and they ate a real piece of fruit. We say apple, it's just fruit. They ate a real piece of fruit from a real tree, and they really fell and sinned and rebelled against God. 
the story of Noah. Noah was a real man. He built a real ark. Real rain came down from heaven and a real flood occurred. The Tower of, Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 is a real historical event. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these were real men. God's people were really enslaved in Egypt. God sent a real man, Moses, who really delivered them from Egypt. There were 12 actual plagues that fell on the Egyptians and the people. Daniel really fell into a den full of what? Lions. There were real lions. Jonah. Jonah was a real man who was swallowed by a real fish, a really large fish. The reason all of that is so important, so vital, so essential, is because... When we get to the New Testament, right? When we get to the New Testament, we believe a real baby named Jesus was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. We believe a real man named Jesus lived a sinless life accomplishing for you what you could not accomplish. And this real man, Jesus, suffered horribly and died a real death on the cross and then this real historical man named Jesus three days later on Sunday was raised from the grave this real Jesus then ascended into heaven and this historical real Jesus one day in the future is coming back you see, when Peter says we were eyewitnesses, he speaks of the historicity of this event and of the Word of God. Let's come back to our point I made earlier. Peter was absolutely convinced of the truths he taught because he had experienced them. Are you experiencing Jesus on a daily basis? I'm asking you, are you abiding in Jesus? Are you walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Is, is Jesus real in your life? Because if he really isn't, number one, you're not saved. Or number two, you are saved and you're not in the word. And you're not praying and you are not pursuing God. Number one then, first point. Scripture can be trusted because it is confirmed by historical testimony. Point number two, Scripture can be trusted because it is inspired by God. Scripture is true because it is from God. Look down in verse 20. Look down in verse 20 and 21. Verse 20, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Verses 20 and 21 are some of the most foundational verses for understanding the authority of Scripture. In verse 20, it tells us it's not the reader's interpretation that defines the truth of Scripture. It's the author, God. And that's critically important. Critically important. We, listen to this, we do not determine what the Bible means. We discover what the Bible means. Let me illustrate it this way. Okay. Uh, let's say that you're, you're married and, and husbands, I'm going to give you an idea. You want to serve your wife, so you go to your wife, you say, honey, I want to bring you lunch this week. Give me a day and tell me what, uh, what you want to eat. So she says, that's great, we'll choose Tuesday. So you're going to bring your wife lunch on Tuesday. What do you want, honey? I want a chicken sandwich, and I want a Christian chicken sandwich, so go to Chick-fil-A and get me a number one. I've, I've ordered a number one many times. Chicken sandwich, fries, and a Coke. She says, I want a chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A. You say, babe, it's done. So you're heading down there Tuesday to get your wife her Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. She's waiting on it. She's excited. But this is what happens. You drive by Whataburger. And you start thinking. 
you know, I think what my wife really wants is a cheeseburger from Whataburger. Big, thick, juicy, red meat, cheese, load it up, get the biggest one they have. So you pull into Whataburger and, and you get your wife and yourself, number of whatever, and you order it and you bring it home. Now, when you bring it home, what is your wife going to say to you, number one? Why did you get that? But and then you would say this, well, honey, I knew what you meant. What you meant was you wanted a Whataburger. No, she didn't. She wanted the Christian chicken Chick-fil-A sandwich. Here's my point. Some people read the Bible like that. Some people read the Bible like that when they think they know what God meant. Right? Let, let me tell you, God, what you really meant. And let, let me stop here because I want to take three or four minutes and, and really equip you when it comes to reading and interpreting the Bible. Because I do believe some, some Christians are, they mean well, they just don't have any tools to interpret the Bible. I want to give you three steps that will help you accurately and faithfully interpret the Bible. And these are from a book, Growing Up, by Robbie Gallaty, who's a pastor. Three steps. Here's the first step. Observation. Observation. In observation, as we open up the Bible, whatever text it is, from Genesis to Revelation, first thing you want to do is you want to observe. You want to ask this question. What does the text say? And if you're a note taker, don't worry about writing all this down. You can just go on the website. All this is on the website. But here are some questions to ask. Number one, who's the author? Who are the recipients? What are the main characters, especially if you're reading an Old Testament story, like when we preach through Joseph, it helps to know the characters. What are the key words? What's the context of the verse? When and where do the events take place? What is the author intending to communicate? So when we're reading what Peter said, we want to know what is it that Peter was intending to communicate. Observation, what does the text say? That's number one. Number two, explanation. If observation is what does the text say, explanation is what does the text mean? Here are some questions to ask as you explain the text. How do verses and phrases relate to each other? What are the key words and phrases? How does, follow this, how does the passage fit into the larger story of the book it's in? How does the passage relate to the storyline of the Bible? I've used this word with you before, meta-narrative. The overarching theme of Scripture, which is God not us, God is redeeming for himself a people through the gospel of Jesus. How then does that passage relate back to the meta narrative? And here's such an important question, especially when you're reading the Old Testament. How does the passage point to who? Jesus. And we saw that when I preached through Ruth, when we preached through Joseph, how the Old Testament is constantly pointing us toward Jesus. So we're going to observe, we're going to explain. What's number three? What's number three? Apply. Now we want to get to application. What does the text demand of me? And let me stop here. Because I know there's a question people ask, and I think they mean well, but, the, but it's phrased bad. And this is the question they ask. They'll say, what does the text mean to me? The problem you have with that is the text only has one meaning, right? So the text isn't going to mean one thing to me and one thing to you. Now, the Bible can be applied in a thousand different ways. That's the beauty of the inspired word. You may read a passage and it may apply to you completely different because of your context than it does to me. But the text has only one meaning. Is there a command or exhortation for how we should live? Something we should do today as a result of reading the Bible. What would the application of this verse look like in my life? Here's a question. What difference does this make in my life? 
As we read the Bible, we're going to observe, we're going to explain, and we're going to apply. Now look with me in verse 21. That's verse 20. No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Verse 21, so formative, so important. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of who? Man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That is an amazing verse. Let me tell you something. I believe and I hope everyone in this room believes what I'm about to say. When we speak of the inspiration of the Bible, what we are saying is this. God... God the Father superintended the human authors so that when they wrote, number one, they were kept from error as they wrote, and number two, they faithfully and accurately gave us a record of what God wanted to communicate. And this is crucial when it comes to our theology of the Bible. Now let me stop and Connect this to our core values. As a church, we have a vision statement. We have a discipleship pathway. And we have six core values that guide us. The first core value, let's put those up there, is we are word-centered. We are a word-centered, a word-driven people. This is the miracle of the Bible, church. Approximately 40 people writing over 1,500 years, and they all agree. It is the, the miracle and the inspiration of this book. Ultimately, God was speaking through them. One more piece of doctrine. It's called verbal plenary inspiration. This is what it means. Verbal, every word of the Bible from the conjunctions to the prepositions to the verbs and the nouns, they're all inspired. Number two, plenary. What, what does that mean? And this is important. That means all of the Bible is equally authoritative. So I don't then read the Gospel of Matthew and something Jesus said, and that somehow has more authority than what Paul said in Romans or what Peter said in 2 Peter or what John said in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John or what Moses said in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Every word's inspired and it is all equally authoritative. Number one, we can trust the Bible. Why? The solid testimony of the apostles. Number two, we can trust the Bible because it's inspired by God. Now, Point number three. Point number three. Scripture can be trusted because it promises the second coming of Jesus. Go back with me to verse 16. We'll work our way through these verses and then I'm finished. In verse 16, Peter says, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The false teachers now, they were spreading a myth. The myth was that Peter was lying when he was talking about Jesus returning. They started asking, where is the second coming of Jesus? Why should we believe you, Peter? Peter then says, we were eyewitnesses, number one, but now look in verse 17 and 18. Let's read this carefully. Verse 17, for when, we, for when he received honor and glory from God, that he is Jesus, the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. What a name for God, the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, God said. Verse 18, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter is referring to the transfiguration. The transfiguration is recorded in Matthew 17, Mark and Luke chapter 9. Go back this afternoon and just read it. It is an amazing story. Let me give you a few wonderful details about the transfiguration. Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Jesus had 12 disciples, and then he had a D group. He had three guys that he would periodically pull aside right, and spend time with them. He takes them up on a mountain, 
And two men from the Old Testament appear with Jesus. Who knows who it was? Moses and Elijah. Jesus is transfigured. I'll mention that in a moment. And he's on a mountain with Moses and Elijah. And the Bible says they're talking. Now, that's the point where if you're Peter, James, or John, don't say anything. Peter, don't. I know you want to say something, Peter, but be quiet. Peter can't be quiet. Peter then, and some of the commentators say, potentially, Peter interrupted them. Definitely don't interrupt Jesus. But even Moses and Elijah, I'm going to give them prominence. So Peter may have said, excuse me, Moses. Um, I just want you guys to know, I'm really glad we're here. That's what he said. He said, it is good that we are here. That is the understatement of all time. He's on a mountain with Jesus, transfigured, Moses and Elijah, and Peter says, man, I'm glad I'm here. It's a good day. And then, Peter, be quiet. He can't be quiet. Peter says, let's build three tabernacles, one for each. Oh, Peter, that's even worse. Because now Peter is saying, let's worship all three of you. And Moses and Elijah are saying, dummy, you're not supposed to worship us. You're supposed to worship Jesus. Let me tell you what Matthew, Mark, and Luke All three of these Gospels include this story, what they say about Jesus. Mark says, Jesus' clothes, this is a quote, were so intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. That's what he says. Luke says, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothes were dazzling white. Matthew says, his face shone like the sun. And then in the text, he says here, God then at some point speaks. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. At this point, Peter's not saying anything. And as a matter of fact, it says the disciples fell on their faces and they were terrified. And I bet they were. Think with me now. Back in 2 Peter, we have this historical event, this transfiguration that Peter's talking about that occurred with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, and Moses, and Elijah. Historical event. Now stay with me. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation is written by John, who was one of the three on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's speaking of the second coming of Jesus. And John says this. He says, his his hair is white like wool, even snow. Then John says at the end of chapter 1, I fell on my face as though I were dead. Could it be that that Peter Peter is, is saying, the reason... I know Jesus is coming back the second time is I received a glimpse of what it will look like on the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw the preview, the movies coming later. That's what he's saying. Look in verse 19. And we have then, after this amazing event he describes, verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. What does he mean? He means this. I have this experience with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. I'll never forget that. And then I have the prophetic word. This experience on the Mount of Transfiguration only points me back to the prophetic word, which is more fully confirmed. He speaks of the strength of the Bible of God's Word. Peter says that majestic moment only confirmed what was already reliable, the prophetic Word of Scripture. Keep in verse 19. He then says, to which you will do well to pay attention. There's a command. Pay attention to the prophetic Word. 
Pay attention to the Bible. Why? Why should we pay attention to the Bible? Look what he says in verse 19 now. As to a lamp shining in a dark place. The Bible is this light. It is this brilliant, resplendent light piercing the darkness in the world, he says. Pay attention to the word. Why? It's light. It's truth in a world filled with lies. The Bible is a sword. The Bible is a fire. The Bible is a hammer. The Bible is your judge. The Bible is living and active, church. Back in verse 19. Pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Look here. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter says, it is the hope of what is to come. That one day, the day will dawn. And church, the morning star will rise. Christ will return. And our faith will become sight then. What I'm saying to you is the Bible can be trusted as God's word. Team, y'all come on up. So what's the, what's the, they say great sermons have asked great things of God's people. What am I asking of you? In a, in a way that you never have before, dig deeper in God's word in 2020. Listen, I had to prepare this message. I've preached it once. I've preached it second. It's convicting to me. I spend too much time watching television, too much time on social media, and not enough time in the Bible. And so let's recommit ourselves to, the, to be a Bible people. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. And just know this. God loves you. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, God loves you. And you may say, Paul, I, I don't even read the Bible. God loves you. Start today, this afternoon. Go home, pull up that Bible reading plan, and start reading. You won't understand everything you read, but if you'll pray and you'll seek God, He will open up His Word. Father, thank you for your word. We trust in the finished work of Christ. We trust in your book that you've given to us, Lord. We pray now that you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me now. We're going to sing one more song, a song of worship, a song of invitation. You want someone to pray with you, you have a decision to make. I'll be down front.
say amen to that? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Be seated for one moment. I can't think of a better way to end our first service in 2020 with a baptism. So you watch as Chad baptizes his little girl, Natalie. Hi, my name is Natalie Fletcher, and I'm nine years old, and I ask Jesus to be my Savior. Jesus died on the cross to forgive my sins. I want to get baptized because it will show people that I'm a Christ follower. Well, good morning. It's such a privilege to be able to baptize my daughter, Natalie, this morning as I was able to baptize my four boys previously um, in years past. And so it's just a great honor and privilege to be able to do this this morning. So, Natalie, uh, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave to give you new life? Yes, sir. And did you accept Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Then it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in the newness of life. I love you. I love you. Thank you.